This episode is sponsored by Bonwee.com. Bonwee gets you the best hotel rates and up to 30% back in rewards. To learn more, visit Bonwee.com. Again, that's B-O-N-W-I.com and start saving money on hotels and get up to 30% back in rewards. IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. Visit itpro.tv slash what dash the dash tech and use the code WTT30 for a free seven day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account. Harry's, stop messing around and get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your free trial offer. $13 value for free, just cover the shipping by going to harrys.com slash what the tech. Hey everybody, welcome to What The Tech. I'm Andrew Zarian and I am joined by a much more handsome and smarter and prettier man, Brad Sams. <laughs> I'll agree with some of those statements. You're, you're much uh, more handsomer and prettier than Paul, together. <laughs> Paul has that like George Clooney thing going on. He's at that perfect age where he's um, older, but not quite yeah. old. <laughs> Paul has it. <laughs> Someone Photoshop a picture of, of, of George Clooney as Paul Therat. I think that's yeah. what we need to do. We need to replace every photo on Therat.com with George Clooney and see if someone will notice. Yeah, I bet you I bet you could get it pretty close if I people think, want it now. I think Paul's way more handsome. Uh, Brad Sams is here with us today because Paul is in Barcelona. Uh, he's gallivanting yep. throughout Europe. Um, so people who don't know, uh, you know, we're all friends here. Brad and I are friends. Paul and Brad yep. are, are very good friends. Uh, I've become the third wheel in this relationship. But at times, <laughs> Brad and I... Tech, you know, we Skype each other and we just trash talk Paul. Yeah. Which is perfect. Uh, I like yesterday, I said, Paul's move has been rough on my life. He's ruining me. And you said the same. So <laughs> and it's uh, it's keeping things interesting, yeah. I think, is the uh, the yeah. fair way to say that. Actually, you know what? I'm really I'm really glad you're here because um, I don't know if you know this uh, and we'll get into all of it. But I've switched over to a PC. Well, I have the Mac here because I was doing some stuff for work, but this is my everyday computer now. Which one is that? Is that the, the Spectre? It's the uh, the HP um, Elite Book. Yeah, the the their their Spectre version of the yep. the Enterprise version. Um, this thing is amazing, actually. I absolutely love it. And we always it's the Elite Book, not it's the Elite Book oh, yeah. um, G two whatever yeah, the latest their, one. Their business line. Yeah. Yep. I have to tell you, this is the best keyboard I've ever used on a laptop. And we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. I want I want your opinion on, you know, what you use and how you use stuff. Obviously, we have a ton of stuff to talk about. But before we do, before we continue, I want to talk, take a moment and talk about a new sponsor of the show. And that's Bon Wee. Um, perfect, perfect segue into this because Paul travels all the time. Uh, I tended to travel a lot now with two kids. Not so much traveling happening. Uh, and Bon Wee is a great website where you can get the best hotel rates and up to 30% back in rewards. Some of those other guys do 2%, some do 10% at best. They do up to 30% back in reward points. Uh, Bonwee is a travel site where you can book your hotels and cars. Uh, they scan all the travel sites to bring you the lowest rate. In fact, they're so good that they offer 110% price guarantee. Not 100%, 110% price guarantee. When you book through Bonwee, you also get up to 30% back in reward points. The reward points could be used for airline tickets, hotel stays, and gift cards. Uh, imagine booking a four to five night hotel stay and getting enough points to get a free airline ticket, additional night, uh, additional night for free, or a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. This is actually great. New members get fifteen hundred re- reward points for just signing up. Go to bonwe.com and start. Book in your hotel and start saving on your hotels. You know what? I'm actually looking to do a night in a city. I live in New York. I live in New York City. But there are times that my wife and I say, you know what? We don't want to go back home to misery and the insanity. So we like to stay in the city. Just go to Bonwi.com. That's B-O-N-W-I.com. And you can start saving money on hotels and get up to 30% reward points. I want to thank them for supporting the show. Bonwi. So, Brad, uh, yep. I actually, I actually want to talk to you about this. Uh, let's start off talking about the creators update, uh, the spring 
release is now almost 100% release, but it's really not because it's actually, you know what's interesting? Um, yes, yes, two days ago, two of my computers that I thought were already updated because two mm -hmm. had already gone through the whole process, I got the update on those like two days ago. Yep. So uh, I, I've been getting asked this question constantly. How are they deploying this? It, what's the pattern for this? Like, why are some of my computers getting it, but other ones aren't? So um, here, here's the best way to figure out how to know when you're going to get the creator's update. Um, go find a, go find some dice <laughs> and just throw them away because they have nothing to do with this. Nobody really knows. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft said that they are going to that they've unlocked the gates, whatever you want to call it. That 1703, which is the Spring Creators update, is now available to everybody. But I can tell you that this machine I'm on right now is not being offered it. And so they said they pushed it to everyone, but they haven't really. So I don't know if this is like a stage rollout. Uh, Microsoft will also do this thing. If you have a known piece of hardware that's causing trouble with the creator's update, yeah. they won't push it to you until that issue is resolved. The problem is they won't tell you what that issue is. So I, I have a, I mean, it's a custom built PC, but it's fairly standard components, 980 TI, uh, 6,700 K processor, 16 gigs of Ram, um, some Samsung SSDs and a crate gaming, uh, motherboard. Nothing like really like, Oh God, I bought this from like a Chinese backwater shop yeah, yeah. and I have no idea where it is and I'm not getting it. And so I, I'm not going to force it on this machine until the fall creators update comes out. Cause I really want some of the stuff that's in that. But, um, yeah, so technically they said it's going to everybody, but it's really not. I suspect that what they do is they still have these, this ring deployment and they're just expanding it at a more rapid yeah. clip. But uh, I mean, there's people on Twitter who are telling me they have a Surface Pro 3, which is a Microsoft device, and they're and they still not being it. offered it. So I actually so, have a Surface Pro, Pro 3 right here, and I don't have it on it. Which, to me, that seems crazy because Microsoft has full control over that. Yeah. They, can they can service the drivers, they can service everything else, and if they're not pushing it to that hardware, um, yeah, I, I don't quite know. So if you haven't gotten it yet, uh, you may get it now. Maybe right now they're sending it to you. Yeah. Um, and then the fall update, I know a lot of people are really confused over this because I got those messages too saying, mm -hmm. fall update's released? No, no, the fall update's definitely not released. Yeah, um, I, I think there was a lot of confusion because this was the spring update and now we're in August, so maybe this is the, people are thinking this is the, the deployment of the fall update and fall update is not released. <laughs> no, fall update, kind of my internal people are telling me September. Um, actually, we already know it's, we don't know it's September. Microsoft initially said September um earlier this year and so people on the inside who said hey you know what we're just about done with this uh what I, I think it will actually ship in september as opposed to being completed in september then shipping the next month i think they're going to complete it here i would guess maybe in the next three weeks or so they're gonna they're gonna lock this thing down and we know that because microsoft has already told us they said hey if you're on an insider builds and you actually want to get the next feature updates they now have this thing called skip ahead which means you're not going to get any more of the stabilizing releases from the fall creators update you're going to jump into what's known as redstone 4 whenever they start pushing those feature updates uh um, so, and, and so if you are if you're like an insider you're not going to get this update you're just gonna skip uh, well ahead. it depends it, it depends so there's two paths there's you, if you don't do anything, you're going to stay on the current Redstone 3 branch, which is a fall creators update. And you will stay on that branch um, just like you normally would on the Insider program. And then when the fall creators update comes out, you have the option of leaving the Insider program and staying on what is known as the retail build or what was historically called RTM. There's another option inside the Insider's drop down menu inside of Windows 10 that now allows you to choose skip ahead, which means you're going to change branches. Think of it as like changing railroad tracks, and you're going to go on to the RS4 path. And if you do that, there's no way to go back to RS3 unless you're willing to wipe out your machine and start all over again. Okay. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> um, I do want to talk about a little bit about the fall update because there are a couple features. One feature that I am very excited for it. and I, I wanted to ask you is it the OneDrive feature the files on demand that they're going to yeah. be adding is this exactly the same thing as the previous you know when you could have the the placeholders yes and no um it accomplishes a very similar task the problem with the old placeholders which was back on the windows i think just windows 8.0 i don't think it was 8.1 uh, days is that it was more of just kind of like the frosting on the cake. It wasn't actually the cake. You were just basically eating frosting 
and in this analogy, yeah, yeah. because the underlying infrastructure was not there to support third party applications. People were getting really confused when you would open up a third party app and you couldn't find the file because the file didn't exact actually exist. What existed was just an icon. And so with the fall creators update, this new file, uh, files on demand, as they call it, it it's at, the file isn't there, but it tells the system that it's there. And so it, it solves that issue of the mach machine being able or applications being able to see all the files, yeah. even if they truly are up in the cloud. And uh, from my understanding, this was actually very hard to do. If you remember, Dropbox, I think, announced something similar called Infinity Files or Infinity Storage or something like that. And I don't know if it's out yet. But I don't it's think because it is. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. It was a. It was going to do somewhat of. A, you you would be able to see the files, but you don't have to necessarily have it there. So iCloud kind of does this too. Yeah, and from my understanding, especially in Windows, you got to remember Windows has a buttload of legacy legacy infrastructure DLL files that literally are from the 80s that Bill Gates partially wrote. I actually knew somebody in Microsoft uh, who was working on the files, and they were signed by Bill G. Like, that's how old some of these things are. And they're wow. still running inside of Windows 10. Yeah, legacy. And so when you're trying to, they're not, spoofing is the wrong word, but when you're trying to trick the operating system and saying, hey, this file's here, when it's really not, it's a very complex task. And it took that team a long time to do it, but they got it right. And I think this is the better implementation this from great. what they had in Windows 8. Yeah, this is phenomenal because, um, you know, for example, I do a lot of video stuff and, and photo stuff and editing mm -hmm. and things like that. And I don't necessarily need to have access to every single thing that I've ever done. Right. But there are times that I need access to something and I don't want to sync it with Dropbox because it's too big. Yep. For the for those moments, this is perfect. Yeah, this no, is it really is. And I mean, you've got kids, so you know this. I just checked. I'm at 74,000 photos yeah. that I have in OneDrive. Yeah. Well, I, you know, my everything is on Google, uh, Google Photos for me. But yeah, I do. I do both. Actually, I, I put them in two different spots. The only reason I do that is, uh, to be honest, I completely prefer Google Photos. I think they do a much better job. Um, I, I worry that maybe one day it goes away or they change their service or whatever. Yeah. And I don't want to have to try to download those and shift them. So what I do is I have one folder that syncs to both OneDrive and Google Photos. It is scary how if there's one catastrophic incident to happen, think about how much information would be lost in, in just, you know, photos and stuff, because nobody ever thinks about it anymore. It just goes to the cloud. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one, one wrong zero <laughs> could really do some damage at one point, you know. Obviously, everything is redundantly backed up. But, you know, to have it locally and to have it yeah. saved on your own, redundancy is always a major, major thing. Um, what feature are you looking forward to in the fall update more than anything else? Because that's mine. That That's really my Well, I was I really looking want. forward to a lot of features um, like Timeline and Cloud Clipboard. But the Microsoft just cut all those features. They tried to revert on what they said. But if you go back and look at what they talked about at Build, they... I, lying is the wrong word, but they're missing the deadlines. Uh, and this is actually the kind of the th well th second big time, but on the third big feature that they've, you know, they said it's coming. It's not the first was my people, and now they have the timeline and cloud clipboard are not coming, uh, not with this next update. So f aside from that, obviously the files on demand is going to be good. There's some I, I kind of as much as it pains me to say this, I like the fluent design, the updated interface stuff. It's very much eye candy. It's completely useless. Serves no benefit to the operating system. But you know what? Every once in a while, it's nice to see the UI kind of change because after all, that's really about all that we're going to get now uh, in the terms of way of substantial changes between yeah. the updates. Uh, the pickup where you left off, uh, the logout of one device, and uh, Cortana asks you if you want to continue working on a project. I mean, that that's pretty handy. Yeah, but if it's so, they implemented this and... Uh, so you can now do it on iOS. To be honest, I haven't tried it on Android yet. It's not great, though. Okay. So if you're on iOS, what you have to do is, let's say you're in Outlook or whatever. Uh, you're in your browser or whatever you want. You have to, you're in the app. It's not like you just open up your PC and it's running. You actually have to open up an app uh, or open the app. Then you have to go to share. Then you have to tap a couple times. I mean, it's probably, uh, I know this is going to sound like anemic or whatever. Anemic is the wrong word. But it takes a good 10, 15 seconds for you to say, okay, I'm on my phone doing this i want to go to my pc back here and do it you have to go to share and then you have to tap on the icon that says send to my pc and then you have to explain what you want it to do and then you hit go and then it opens on your pc it's okay it, it's not as um seamless as kind of i think everybody hoped and i i totally understand why microsoft can't do it because they don't own the os but um it's it's one of those things that's neat i the concept strongly is great, suspect yeah. that 
not many people are going to use it. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, these little features here and there, like the, the travel back in time thing that you're going to be able to do and, and the pick up where you left off. Uh, these are just small incremental feature changes that or, or feature updates that they're doing. At this point, I think the biggest problem that they have is what are they going to do with, you know, the the universal apps, uh, the, the Windows Store and all the legacy applications uh, going forward? Because to me, it seems like they really want to push this this Windows 10S concept and further continue that. I we had this discussion with Paul a couple of weeks ago, and, and it's still daunting to me that you're buying a a high-end you know upwards of a thousand dollar device and you're not necessarily getting a full-fledged version of windows you could upgrade for free till december but what do you what's going to happen after that and how many people are going to be confused you and i had discussed this when they mm -hmm. had announced it and what what we were talking about is if Microsoft were to take their applications and make, you know, make full fledged versions in the new new way that they want to do it, it would be better encouragement for software developers to do it. Yeah, there Microsoft has a bigger issue that um, that I don't know if many people really admit to or Microsoft and <laughs> it's a lot. Well, the, the thing is, is you don't really need Windows anymore. Um, and it, I'm not saying like you can run your life off, off an iPad windows in itself is a platform that allows you to do other stuff, right? It allows you to run a browser, allows you to run your ERP application, allows you to run Skype for business or link or whatever the hell, you know, pick your favorite application. The thing is windows itself is just something that enables you to do actual productivity. Uh, and People don't want to have to deal with maintaining Windows anymore because it's no longer the thing that they need. It's the thing that they're forced to use. And so what Microsoft is trying to do is trying to make Windows more, uh, more streamlined so there's less maintenance and all that stuff. But the problem is, is that people just don't care. They, they install Windows so they can install SAP, they can install Chrome, they can do whatever. But to actually use Windows, they don't use it unless yeah. you're an IT pro. And those people don't have the decision power to really kind of upend the infrastructure. I know someone's going to write me and say, yes, they do. No, you really don't because you don't control the budget. And so when people look at it, they're going to try to get the best bang for their buck. And Windows 10S isn't it because you have to invest more resources to get everything to work inside that environment. And it's on Microsoft's burden to make sure that Windows 10S is as good as pro or enterprise or even home without the user having to take on that overhead. And until they can get rid of taking on that overhead of either a learning new applications, um, dumping the application that they prefer to use an alternative choice, uh, they have to get rid of that. And that's an extremely hard thing to do in a platform that's 25 plus years old yeah. and has all this legacy product. And the benefit of updating that legacy product for SAP or any of these companies is almost none. Yeah, uh, it, it's 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 a sticky situation right now for them, right? I mean, they they want to go in that direction. Obviously, that's the direction Microsoft wants to go. This yep. is what they see. It's a it's a better, you know, it, it, it fundamentally, you know, if you think about it, it's a better uh, code. It's it's easier. It's lighter. Uh, it's technically well, no, supposed uh, let me, to be quicker. Let me hold on a second. Um, so not really. It's not any lighter. Windows 10S is quite literally just Windows 10 with some software blocks in it that don't allow you to run legacy applications. Uh, I, I believe that it is the not, exact same. Not the operating same. system. Not the, I'm, yeah. I'm saying like software. Uh, you know, op when you run software, isn't the software supposed to be lighter? If, you, if you're using, let's say, uh, technically, right? Let's say there's a, there's a version of Office. Is, is that going to be lighter than the, than the standard, you know, no, what, the biggest difference is that it's now sandboxed, essentially. So okay. uh, it's just packaged up so that that application, in theory, shouldn't have as much impact on the operating system. But at the same time, that application isn't can't be as powerful as a Win32 app because it doesn't have all the API access that a traditional app has. Yeah. So the trade-off is that anything that comes from the Windows Store, when you close it out, it's done. It's gone from your system's processes. It's not running anymore, as opposed to a Win32 app that could technically um, just leave some baggage behind either in the startup 
uh, folders or it's still running in the background doing processes. And so it's more powerful, but at the caveat of it could impact performance uh, outside of the application, whereas UWP applications are containerized, uh, they automatically update. They're much easier to service from a user perspective. You don't do anything, they just update. And they're sandbox, which gives you better protection. But it, they're not any smaller. Like so a lot of what Microsoft is pitching is to use uh, Cent Centennial Bridge. Yeah. Like for uh, Spotify, for example, essentially, lack of better term, they, they just run it through this converter and then it's the exact same app just in a sandbox but it's the same weight and everything else so it's not like it's uh, like a reduced footprint from a size perspective on your hard drive i i i thought that i thought i had read that the applications are, are going to be they're going to use less resources and it's a better way to i guess the code is is better it's not it's not as heavy in so Yes and no. It depends. Because if somebody writes a true UWP application, that should be true. Yeah. Not but, not not going through convert obviously, not going through, you know, right. some sort of conversion to 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 run it. But if you're if you're rewriting it from the from from the ground up, let's say Photoshop, for example, right? Great example yeah. because it's, it's it's I have it, you have I mean almost everybody that I know that is somewhat of a power user has Photoshop or yep. any of those Adobe Suite products. If Adobe decided we're going to take this serious. UWP is the future. Uh, this is what we're going to start doing. And they write from the ground up a new version of Photoshop for UWP. Technically, that should be a far more efficient piece of software. We would think so. We don't quite know. Um, because nobody's it, done it. <laughs> nobody's done it. Like So right now, Adobe has Photoshop elements in the Windows Store. Yeah. But again, it's just Centennial that they've ported over. And I, I would be willing to bet a significant amount of money that Adobe is never going to tear down Photoshop and rewrite it from the ground up just to get it into the store because what's the benefit? They're, they're, yeah. Microsoft wants a Windows 10 S world, but they can't get there unless everybody comes along for the ride and everybody, or not everybody, but let's just say 80% of the population of app developers have to buy in. And if they're not willing yeah. to buy in, then you can never get to Windows 10 S. Oh, even the Look ones at that Chrome, do buy for in. example. Yeah. Chrome is perfect. We we know that hardly anybody uses Edge. Yes, there are people that use it, but um, the vast majority of the world uses Chrome. And what's going to happen is I don't see Google coming over to the Windows Store anytime soon because then they lose some control over their browser. Hell, even Edge, Microsoft's own browser, is not in the store. So why would Google yeah, move to the store it. and then be limited by what they're allowed to do well, that, when Microsoft's own browser? That was the discussion Paul was having with me. Is Microsoft's products aren't in the store? Why? What incentive? What? What push? What motivation do other software developers have to to make the product go in the store? So what, if yep. this is if this is the case, I mean. Is Windows 10 S just an experiment again? I, I mean, who, who, what is this going to happen? You know, four years from now, three years from now, five years from now, is Windows 10 S going to be a thing? I mean, we saw what happened with Windows RT. Yeah, I, I think Windows 10 S will stick around because for Microsoft to maintain it, it's not a whole lot of work. Uh, I, I really think the future is going to be uh, Windows on ARM, which is coming later this year, which I suspect will probably be, when we, we haven't seen Microsoft full deck of cards yet on Windows 10 on ARM. We know that it does x86 emulation just fine, but I could see them also pushing these ARM devices as being Windows 10 S ARM. Oh, uh, so when you run on a Snapdragon device, you're going to get that experience. That makes some sense. Yeah. But again, it's going to be, they need a population of devices to prove to developers that, hey, it's worth your time to port it because now there's uh, 10 million ARM devices running out there and it's growing and you need to be able to access those users. That's a, that's a compelling reason. Yeah, very compelling. But, but as of right now, that compelling reason doesn't exist because it's like, okay, let's go put our app in the store so Microsoft can take a cut every time we sell it. Yeah. <laughs> um, with with Windows on ARM, with the emulation, I, I think, I don't know if you and I spoke about it, but um, I got an email from someone that kind of knows this stuff, and he broke down, he, he was trying to explain to me how there's a good chance that Windows on ARM, if a, a, a running a Windows, you know, a Windows-based software through emulation will not perform at the same level. But mm -hmm. isn't it isn't it doing hardware emulation and software emulation at the same time? It's not traditional yeah. emulation, right? Yeah. So the, it, it's I, I believe you're correct. Well, 
actually I think is what it's doing is it's doing all the emulation on the chip. I think that's the big breakthrough is that the so- I don't even know if it's actually doing I'm it has to it somewhere doing some software emulation yeah. but the performance gains and the reason why it works is that it's actually built into the the system on a chip the SoC and that is why this is finally working is because anytime you do software emulation yeah. uh, you're going to get degraded performance if you can do it at the chip level which is significantly harder not only from a technical reason but also a patent and licensing reason then you get that much improved performance like if you think about all the uh, console emulators that used to come out i remember growing up as a kid be downloading like nes emulators and all that stuff i still have all of them yeah i still have them all they were fine because you had a low power chip and you could do it all in the software and intel chip x86 chips are extremely complex and it's very hard to emulate those purely through software that's why we don't see it very much and so uh the fact that they were able to do it at the chip level is a that's the breakthrough in all of this is that it's baked in i was playing around with um i, I don't know if you've ever played around with the software called wine w-i-n-e yeah no yeah it was, so it was for linux it, yeah so I, it's it's also on the mac and I was playing around with it to run a Windows, you know, based software, uh, Next 86 software on the Mac. Mm-hmm. And I got it to run. I, I, you know, I was just, I was bored one night. I was just doing it. Sure. And it actually got, I got it to work. It wasn't the best. I mean, it wasn't running unbelievable, but it did work. You were, I was able to make this software run properly. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that what, what the market will happen when ARM is now running essentially full-fledged Windows. Yeah, it, it, well, you know, the loser in this is Intel. And to be honest, I don't have a, like, a lot of, uh, I've, I'd play a very small violin for them because they've done this to themselves. Yeah. Um, it, don't get me wrong, people at Intel are very smart and very bright, but they totally ruin the market by basically screwing over AMD. Uh, they haven't been able to get into the mobile segment now granted people have always said because they don't have the technology they weren't able to get down fast enough that's part of it i also think that a lot of people are very scared that if intel owned the mobile device market like the cell phones and all that stuff they'd be the same thing as the desktop and so there was a big benefit of going to arm because essentially arm creates the instruction set and then license it out to the qualcomm's and nvidia's and all yeah. that stuff and you have true competition which is good for as, as a consumer you should always want competition no matter how many companies um, it can be ruthless but at the end of the day the consumer, the wins. consumer wins yeah and, and thankfully we're starting to see that again on the desktop with these amd thread rippers uh and the ryzen granted the per core performance isn't the same but as a value they are extremely good you can get an eight an eight core uh ryzen chip or thread ripper whatever the branding is on that particular model for about half the cost of an intel and you get just about the same performance for half the cost and so we're finally starting to see this on the desktop and Intel is going to suffer because these ARM chips are, are looking pretty dang good. ARM chips can go in the server. ARM chips also have LTE and cellular connectivity built in. Yeah. And so it's not like you need third party. Uh, you don't you don't need another modem and all that stuff. And, and, and so I, and these and these uh, these low powered, I guess, Intel. I don't, I don't know which one is their their current. You know, what what is what is Intel's low power uh, current system on a chip platform? Uh, well, so they have Atom or but, but they had Cherry Trail, and I don't know. Like, yeah, they might have whatever. actually given up on it. Uh, they, they might have given up. I, I, I mean, I, I have, a, I have a Cherry Trail, you know, Chinese knockoff iPad here, right? Mm-hmm. It runs Windows, and it runs, uh, it runs Android. It was sent to me to like review, and Paul and I thought it was hysterical because it's an iPad three with Intel inside, running Windows yeah. and uh, and AMD and um, AMD, geez, and uh, Android. Um, but it's terrible, you know. It, it's not. Intel just could not do mobile. They couldn't do it. Luckily, I mean, for everybody else, right? That they they kind of fell behind in this. But now AMD's coming catching up on the PC side. It's like you said, these chips. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I I was looking at the benchmarks, and they are damn close for a fraction. Yeah, forty percent less in price. Yeah, I like. If I were to build a computer today, I definitely wouldn't buy an AMD bulldozer chip, which was their last gen. And it was, frankly, it was garbage compared to what Intel was offering. But these, this current gen, because Intel went to, what is it, tick, tock, tock instead of tick, tock, tick and tock. Yeah. Because they're kind of at, they're, they're quite literally running up into the, the boundaries of physics, uh, is allowing AMD to catch up. And this, AMD is doing a great job, and I'm, I'm very happy to see them doing well. Uh, I, I wrote an editorial probably five years ago. It's probably one of my favorite things I've ever written. And it was the, the 
title was it's who's going to win can intel scale down faster or can arm scale up faster who's going to win because if intel could have scaled down faster than arm could scale up they would have owned the market they would have just destroyed everything but they couldn't they couldn't scale down that fast they missed that market and arm is scaling up exponentially faster than intel could go down and then intel just gave up on the low end market they laid some people off from it and uh, there's a very good chance your next machine especially for somebody like my parents uh, like next year, if I go to buy them a cheap laptop or whatever for a birthday or something, it could be arm powered for arm multiple powered. reasons. Yeah. One, if it's arm powered, what we don't know, and Microsoft hasn't clarified yet, I've been trying to poke them about this, is what happens if you get a Win32 virus on that machine? Uh, be- because, yeah. because it's emulated, because Windows and app, those applications are being emulated, are they going to be, is it something that you can just wipe out and just like re-image instantly? Because again, it's virtualized Windows inside of that world. It's not running truly on the silicone, even though it's emulated there, it's still an emulation package. So that's, if you get a virus. very interesting. Yeah, I've, I haven't even thought about that. So what happens? We don't know. That's that's the thing. Like if Mike, if that truly works and that there's a new infrastructure that, these viruses can't work with and maybe it's some sort of windows 10 s and this arm stuff this is i'm very optimistic about this arm stuff because it's a very rare chance in microsoft's history to reboot right they have a, a a moment where they can take what we know as windows and do all the ui stuff that we recognize and some of the stuff underneath but they're now running on arm and they have a chance they tried to do it with mobile and they failed but the desktop is a different beast, and that's why they keep saying they're building laptops and stuff, is they have a chance to reboot their infrastructure on this stuff. And I know it's not perfect, and people go, Brah, but no, they still need all that crap. Yes, I understand, but again, it's virtualized. That The, the fact that it's virtualized in the, is, that environment is a game changer for Microsoft in what they can do. Essentially, you're because sandboxing not- everything. At that point. Right. Be- yeah. Because what they could do is behind the scenes is they could retool Windows on ARM and that desktop experience to run more efficiently or more effectively, at least on moderate class machines than Intel. And if they can do that underneath the hood, then you don't need a freaking Intel chip anymore. You no. don't have to worry about viruses and guess because who's gonna, everything is and now guess, modern. Guess who's going to deploy all ARM ba- all ARM based uh, devices? Enterprise. Yeah. It, now, now don't get me wrong. We're still going to need these super high-end horsepower machines for like what we do, Andrew, like video editing, yeah. CAD software. Um, you're going to need high horsepower, probably gaming as well. Like it's Intel's not going to go away, not even close. I don't want them to go away personally. But for the – like I always think back to like the accountant – the accountant and finance team inside of any corporation, they make up a large chunk of the overhead of the user base. And what do they need? They need the office suite. And maybe and maybe some ERP applications, but most ERP applications these days can run in a browser. Yeah. And what do you need a high horsepower machine for? What you need is a secure machine that's lightweight with long battery life, and that is ARM all day of the week. Uh, I think this is such an interesting discussion to have, um, especially that that aspect of ARM, right? You know, everybody yeah. thinks performance, 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 but when you talk about the fact that it's emulating and you're kind of sandboxing this, and Microsoft does have a very interesting opportunity that they've never had f- to deploy this with security in mind. And that's kind of the, yep. that's kind of the discussion with Windows 10S, right? That, that's, yeah. that's, that's part of it. But that may not be the, the, the discussion we're going to have in a couple of years. Maybe the fact that this version of Windows on ARM is what they are looking forward to do. I want to continue this discussion because it's really, really cool. But before we do, I want to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, and that's IT Pro TV. Guys, uh, if you're watching this live right now, I mean, the things that we're talking about, it, it gets complicated, right? We're talking about a system on a chip and, and, and emulation and security and things like that. You know, I like to do a show for the for the everyday computer user, the enthusiast. I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm an enthusiast more than anything else. Brad is way more of an expert than I am. He knows everything. I know very little compared to compared to him, but I, I try to hang and I try to learn constantly. I have a background in IT, but everything has changed from the time that I did IT 10 years ago. The industry is constantly growing. And you, as your company's IT, your company's sysadmin, wh- whatever your position is in technology, you have to constantly stay afloat. You have to constantly learn. And I cannot sit and watch a boring seminar for two hours. But what I can do is go to IT Pro TV and watch 
one of the over, one of the videos that they have over 2000 hours of on demand training with more than 125 hours added weekly uh everything from ethical hacking to linux microsoft servers aws apple's mac management uh and then you go into different things like you they have a they have a whole tutorial on photoshop and and, and the adobe suites they have an unbelievable lineup an unbelievable product choice uh for you to select when it comes to video down video was on demand to learn you know I'll give you an example the us alone has more than a half a million open tech positions with cybersecurity jobs at the top of the list are you and your it team ready for this at it pro tv it training can help you fill the skill gap and it's fun it looks unbelievable so here's a great offer if you go to itpro.tv slash what hyphen the hyphen tech and use the code WTT30, uh, you get a seven day free trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account. You get 30% off your subscription. Uh, they also, guys, it's also free. They have a free service also. So that's one of the packages. But if you want to go check them out, just go to itprotv.com slash what the hyphen the tech. I'll have the link in the chat room and I'll have the link in the show notes. If you go there and you sign up, you can sign up for the free package and you get access to all their live stuff. They do an unbelievable amount of content every single week, 125 hours of content every single week. You get access to the live stuff. Plus, they have stuff that's free in there so you can play around and you can learn. I'm telling you guys, they do an unbelievable job. If, you, if you're a fan of Twit, for example, and you like the screensavers, they have, I mean, they, they kind of fit that mold. Uh, of of how they present the stuff. It's really, really awesome. And I love those guys. IT Pro TV, guys, go check them out. I want to thank them for supporting the show. Uh, great company, great product. Uh, it looks unbelievable, too. They put in so much effort in their in their presentation with uh, production. They should be really proud of what they're doing. It's rare to find high production values when it comes to, you know, almost like an online IT training. <laughs> it's, it's, more, it's way more than a Google Hangout, guys. I'll tell you that. Brad, you've sat through those calls. <laughs> <laughs> my my fair share. That yeah, is, uh, yeah, that's that's for sure. You, you can't escape them. No, but th these guys do an unbelievable job. So, um, to continue this discussion, because I want to, what does this mean for Windows? I, and I'm going to use the term Windows Mobile. When when now with ARM coming in play, does this bring Windows Mobile back into play? You know this this concept. Uh, no. <laughs> when, <laughs> Windows Mobile's dead. Why can't you we, we've lie? Known this. Why Microsoft, can't you just... it, like it, it doesn't matter. You can be as ignorant as you want. If you think that Windows 10 Mobile is going to come back to resurgence and, and life, it's not going to happen. Now, is Microsoft giving up on mobile? No, they're not. I think my gut tells me, and I, I've heard some things like they're exploring with the stuff. I know everybody's like the mystic, mythical service phone. They're doing something in the mobile space. It's just not coming from that Windows 10 Mobile branch. If you have a Windows 10 mobile device or Windows phone, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It's not going to get upgraded. You are at the end of the life. Um, and I don't know when your next hero savior device is coming or what it's going to look like. Uh, I have a rough guess about how it will work, but um, it, it's done. Microsoft isn't developing it. They, they, they're they maintaining it. And that's why we see these bug releases coming out and all that stuff. But they've What's written over? off all of their hardware aspects of it. They're not releasing any new phones. So, Yeah, I... I, you know, it's. It, I feel like it was such a missed opportunity, <laughs> and I don't know if they could have done anything else. I mean, what 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 could they have done to make this platform, you know, have ten percent market share? For example, was there? Well, they did have ten percent market share in some places. What some they, places, yeah. What they could have done is they could have launched it three years earlier. Is mm -hmm. what they needed to do. Yeah. That's well. That's the story of Palm. That's the story of all everybody. Right? Android was the only one that could do it because they saturated the market. Yeah, Marcus saturation uh, won the battle. There's, I mean, you got to remember too is every it, even launching three years earlier at the same time as iOS may not have done anything because you got to remember there's, there's a lot of people out there that just don't like Microsoft and don't like Windows. Um, one of the reasons why Android and iOS took off is because it was different. It wasn't Windows. It wasn't made by Microsoft. It wasn't made at that time made by what many people perceived to be an evil company. Remember, Microsoft didn't get to the where they are today because they were nice and friends. Um, they murdered a lot of companies along yeah. the way, like Netscape and WordPerfect. Um, wasn't that made by Novell? Uh, and they, they made a lot of enemies in the world. And so when 
this mobile revolution took off and people are like, oh, look, I have three options now. I can go buy Windows Mobile, which was, what, 6.5 or whatever. I can go buy this this new thing from Apple that looks kind of neat or whatever. And then this other, you know, growing company called Google has this other thing called Android, which many people forget. Google bought Android. They didn't develop it. They bought that company. And it was the and, first version of it was not great. No, but initial, you got to remember, yeah. nor was... What was then called, what was it called? OS X on your phone or whatever Apple yeah. called it. It wasn't called iOS 1. Uh, that phone, that version wasn't great either. Yeah. It was actually pretty limiting. It had no MMS. It didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot. it didn't have 3G um, at that time. And so it, it, Microsoft lost for a lot of reasons, most notably being late. But at the same time, they just, you know, people like things that are new. Why did some people switch to a Mac? It's because, you know what, I've been using Windows for a while. That's what I did. This, this, it looks neat. It looks interesting. Yeah. Let's see what it's like. And and ten you know years what? later, a, one, yeah. a decade. I've been uh, my you know I always I always say uh, my everyday machines are, are in my office. You know I use Windows. Yeah. I use PCs for everything that I do to produce this. But my everyday laptop became a Mac, and I did it because I was bored, and I wanted to try something new. Ten years later, I you know I just got my first PC. You know my my yeah. my this is the first laptop I've owned in ten years. That's a PC. You know, mm-hmm. real, real deal. You know, not not a not a mid yeah. low level PC, but this is the first one, and I absolutely love it. And it's become my everyday, you know, beat up laptop. I I could take this thing, and I and I feel comfortable using it. It's actually I this will go into the next discussion with you, but um, you're right. People change, and once you change, it's hard to bring them back. Yeah. And it's, I don't want people to think that I like hate Windows or something. I love Windows. I'm using a three screen monitor here right now, and it, Windows 10 works great. I have no, I, the things when I complain about Microsoft, it's when they say they're going to do something and they don't, like these feature updates, or they have a product like Skype that should be working great. Skype is the biggest tragedy, I think, inside of Microsoft right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, here, here's why, though, because look at like a, an app like WhatsApp that has a billion users, mm-hmm. a billion. That should have been Skype by every measure ever. That should have been Skype. Skype should have been the billion user platform. And it's been stuck at around 300 and 330 million, something like that, users for quite a while. But it's because Microsoft didn't quite understand what they bought. They didn't understand the market. They didn't understand what people wanted. And they spent too much time trying to screw around changing the infrastructure that they missed WhatsApp and all these other chat applications. Skype existed. And we're using it right now because... Uh, Andrew, I actually talked to Microsoft uh, last week about Skype and some of the stuff, the complaints that I had had. And I said, guys, you don't realize what you have. You have the best known right now yeah. video chat application that is just going to work. We use it for podcasting. We use it for all this stuff. And you're not throwing us a bone at making it easier to use because, Andrew, you can contest to this, how much work it actually goes to put two people side by side and record this video. It's not like you just open Skype yeah. and just call me. Yeah, uh, you got to have several machines running. you got to route the audio. And I explained this to them and they're like, oh, I didn't realize people use that for it. It's like, guys, like even even if you have a video call, just a group chat, you know what would be nice is at the end of it, you could click a button that says download and you could download that call. Y- yeah. You know what? And other people are doing it. Yeah. Right. Other people are doing it. it-, it- it's to me, I think there is a, a, a an identity crisis happening within Skype because what are they? Are they a chat service? Are they a video service? Are they a phone call service? Now mm-hmm. they have Skype TX, which they're using Skype for, uh, you know, big production value stuff. They have 5,000 things happening and I don't, and is Skype making money at the end of the day? Yeah, I would assume it is. It's somewhere. I don't know. But that was my point. Skype it's like, premium. okay, Give me I understand you guys have Skype, Skype TX, but there is a market for people that use this stuff for small businesses. I would happily give Microsoft 100 bucks a year to be able to download video calls or to do exactly what we're doing right now yeah. without having to wire up seven different machines to make this call happen. I, I seriously would give Skype 100 bucks a month. Yeah. To, to for my for, I mean, obviously, I use it in a business sense, right? Because my my entire company relies on on using this platform. Um, I would be willing to pay a monthly fee to get what I want. You know, download download the video. Let's say you're, you're Paul's in Spain right now. Yeah. I would love to be able to say, I know Paul's going to have some bandwidth problems. I don't want you to determine what his bandwidth is. Exactly. Let me pull this thing down a little. Let me flip to SD for Skype. Let me let me change the audio sound. I would be willing to pay that, and especially for an enterprise. I mean, think about it. How many how many uh, teleconference softwares have existed that fail? Yeah. And Skype has this ability to really 
give the consumer, give give the enterprise user, uh, the corporate user, what they want. And I don't know what direction they're headed. Yeah, it, it's it, that's why I refer to it as the biggest tragedy because there's so much potential here that they missed. Well, on and... the phone, look look at it on the phone now. I I don't know what the software has become. Oh God, the phone. That's so that's what kicked off the call with Microsoft. Is I was just. So the my the biggest thing that pisses me off about the phone is if you are if I'm chatting with you, uh, the most common or well known gesture in iOS is if you take your thumb and you swipe from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, you go back. Yeah. Right. If you're on Twitter and you're reading a tweet, you do that gesture, you go back. If you have Reddit open, you go back. If you have a, a browser open, you do that, you go back. And Skype, if you do that gesture, it goes to find. It, it, it takes you to this pl this panel where you can insert GIFs or maps or YouTube videos. It doesn't take you back to the all contact list, which I, every time I do this, I just want to throw my phone against the wall. It's because I'm not using this. If I want to send stupid yeah, photos. This is where it does. It yeah, you, it yeah. takes you to that screen. Like It's like, guys, like did you not think about this for one second? Um, I understand why they added all this fun crap that Snapchat like like I don't have a problem with that. The the problem I have is that they messed with the core functionality and navigation of the app, which really pissed me off because much like you, I have I've counted roughly 80 people I talk to on Skype. I use this service every single day. And when they changed the navigation to something that boneheaded, that's when it, I was like losing my mind is because I, I, I was being less productive, which is the exact opposite of what Microsoft wants. Yeah, um, I I always have this discussion. And I have spoken to people at Skype from not the not the software side, but more of the technical, mm -hmm. you know, uh, performance and stuff like that. And it, it it seems to me that there's multiple people wanting different things for this for the future of this platform. Sure, that's what it looks like, and they are now trying to compromise with everybody, so everybody loses out a little bit. And I think this UI. It's pretty. I get it. I get why they're going forward with, but it's a little convoluted with the navigation. You're right. Um, if I want, like, even in calls, right, going back and forth, and like, if you're in a call and you want to send a message, it's still a little wonky. It's not yeah. fluid. You know, sometimes things work the way that they work, and then you just build on top of that. You don't have to always mess with it. Yep, we're the old guys yeah. now. Don't 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 change this. You know, don't change that. But at the end of the day, you kind of have to. Well, and I'm not, and I'm okay with change as long as they give us the ability to maintain the same level of functionality that we had prior to the change. Yeah. Uh, they just pushed out an update, I think this week or, or late last week, that improved the content density inside the chat windows. They made things smaller, which that was a big negative feedback because chat bubbles were massive for whatever god awful reason. And so they they're improving that. Uh, when I talked to them, I said, if you can improve the navigation, that will be a big win as well because the rest of the app is okay. And I understand why the features are there, but don't make them overtake what's the value portion of the app today. Yeah, and absolutely. So, uh, my, my big fear is that they were going to bring all that mentality to their modern app on the desktop and then we were going to lose the classic app and then I was going to be stuck with this like colorful Facebook chat bubble looking thing rather than an app that I can actually use to just chat with people because that's what we that's what I need at the end of the day. So that that goes into a great conversation now. Uh, what are they doing with the desktop app? So, well, the desktop app's going away. They they keep trying to force everybody to it, but you might know this. I know I definitely know it. The modern app does not support yet the Blackmagic video capture cards. Uh, yeah. Well, let me correct. Let me correct that. It will support the audio side of it, but it does not currently allow you to ingest the video. And yeah. I, I told this to Microsoft, and I have the guy's name. And every time an update comes out, I check it and I send him a message, and he says, "Thanks for the update," um, because I can't switch to that until Blackmagic cards are supported. It that's a, uh, if they kill this desktop app, which I don't think they will because of Windows Seven. They'll force people. To, they'll push people to the modern app. But they can't get rid of it fully because Windows Seven is still has like fifty eight percent of the market. Um, but well, the way that the way that that um, that works is that it, it tricks Windows into thinking it's a webcam, right? That, I mean, that's how it's always worked. So if yep. it's not able to do that, uh, because it's a whole different base of coding. Yeah, um, I don't like the modern app at all. I don't like that new the new Skype the UWP app um, at all. But what happens on the Mac? What do they do for the Mac? Do they still continue yeah. making a desktop version for the Mac, or do they go web? You know, you can't just kill it yeah, on that's... Windows and then continue it on another platform. Mm -hmm. On a platform I don't think that they're doesn't... gonna. 
my gut tells me that I don't think they'll kill it for quite a while because, again, Windows 7 is going to exist up until the year 2020. Yeah. They might stop supporting it with new features, which, to be honest, is fine. I just I'm need okay it to with work. Yeah. Uh, that's the route I see them going and just pushing everybody to the modern stuff. But they can't. I don't think they can kill the desktop. They could be try to be jackasses about it and not let it run on Windows 10. But that's when we call up our friends like Rafael Riviera, who and, is smart enough to figure out yeah. how to work around that. But I, I don't. I can't see them killing it because they would. It it would hurt. It would hurt them more than it would help. But them. are they going over to the UI? Like, are, are they? totally going to the same UI on all platforms now? Is that, is that the know. idea? That, that was my big fear is that, like I, I think I said it, but that was my fear is that they were going to replicate the phone UI to the desktop and then you're sitting there like, oh my God, I have this phone UI that was garbage and now I have it on my desktop, which is garbage. And uh, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, before we continue with one more topic, I want to thank our sponsor, Harry's. Get your free trial set. That includes a razor handle, the five blade cartridge and the shaving gel by going to harrys.com slash what the tech shaving sets start at just $15. Uh, but they have a great offer for you guys. You could sign up uh, and you will get a, um, they, they will send you a free shaving set. You can sign up for their trial. You just have to cover the shipping. That's all you have to do. I've been using a Harry's razor for probably a couple years now. And it, it's it's so much easier to deal with a Harry's razor because it's high quality blades. You're not dealing with a cheapo blade that you buy in the store. They last longer. You're not cutting yourself. It, it's a it's a great, great product. And by the way, I give them I have four Harry's boxes. I just got two more that I have to give to somebody. I just hand them out to my relatives. If it's their birthday, I just give them a Harry's razor. They love it. They open this beautiful box. Uh, it, it's it's a really nicely done uh, you know gift box that it comes in. It, it's really easy. Also, listen, it's just two dollars a blade. It's it's two dollars two dollars a blade or less, which is about half the price of the leading five blade brands out there. Uh, they do an unbelievable job at Harry's making high quality products, and you will love it uh, if you if you sign up now. If you go to sign up for the free trial set, you just have to cover the shipping. You could go there at harrys.com slash what the tech. I want to thank them for supporting the show. Um, one more thing I want to ask you. What are you using currently every day? What is your <laughs> every day? You know, what phone? What I, I, I talk about this with Paul all the time because I'm really into what people use and why they yeah. use that. Um, so it's predominantly Windows. I mean, except from the phone side. So my daily phone jumps around. But for, for the most part, it kind of always comes back to just an iPhone 7. Um, mostly because it just simply works. That's what I need at the end of the day. Uh, I do use a couple different Nexuses. Um, actually, holding on to the Nexus 5X from LG, I really like that phone. I kind of refuse to give it up. Uh, and I keep that phone activated. It's running on Project 5. And then so this machine that I'm podcasting from is just a custom build with two 4K monitors and a 1080p over here that I keep RSS on. And then my insider machine is this very beautiful back here Surface Studio that Microsoft sent me. And a uh, laptop that I use for the other podcast I do with Paul Thurat, that's a Surface Pro right there. And then the laptop that I actually take around, like if I was coming to New York, um, I would carry the Surface Book with Performance Base. So uh, I, you know, first of all, that laptop, the... Um that surface behind you is absolutely stunning. So fun, fun little story. People always ask me about what this uh, screensaver is that's on here. Yeah. Uh, you can download, and I, it's probably, I'm sure it's illegal. I don't know. Maybe it's not. Uh, this is actually the Apple TV screensaver, the default one. Oh, you could download it. You can. It's even better than that. It updates. Oh no. <laughs> the new stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. And so, like, it's honestly, it's beautiful. Like, yeah. Apple did, I think it shot, I want to say, shot at, like, 240 frames per second on a drone. And I will sit here, and I will catch myself just watching. Like, it's, they did a really good job, yeah. and that screen is so damn beautiful. My father's studio. always amazed by it, actually. He brings it up all the time on my Apple TV when he goes to the default screensaver. He'll always yeah. say, like, wow, that's so nice. It looks so good. It's just kind of soothing, and that's what's running on that thing uh, during the day. I mean, it's a great use of that machine, but um, but that's what I run Insider Builds on, and it actually does get a lot of use. I'm on this thing probably an hour a day. Very, very cool. No, I'm always curious what you – and, and what, what mic do you use? So this is the Blue Yeti Pro, uh, which then connects – in. so speaking of Skype, so Skype – as you know, you can select different mics. And so when we do First Ring Daily – When it wants you to, Brad, when it allows yeah. you. 
Yeah. We use, I can't grab it, but it's a wireless mic. And so I got really annoyed having to always switch mics back and forth. And uh, for another thing we did down in New Orleans, we bought a soundboard. And so this was like, I spent like 150 bucks to solve a $1 problem. But now this microphone and the wireless microphones goes into a sound mixer. Actually, Andrew, I think it was one you recommended. And the then, Behringer. yeah, the Behringer. Yep, the four channel Behringer and a bunch of different knobs that I don't know what they do. And then that all goes into Skype. So that way I never have to switch mics. I just mute or unmute which one I'm going to be using. Yeah. My, our, our setup is a little bit more complicated. We've gone IP based. <laughs> this is all IP based. Really? Yeah. Uh, which, which we should talk about that. I think you'll find it interesting. No, I, 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 I always find it. I'm always fascinated with what other people use and how they use it. And, uh, sure. and I like to continue that discussion. But we are out of time. Brad, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me just about anywhere. My, I've been pretty diligent. You can find me on just about any platform as BD Sams. That's what it is on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and uh, Xbox Live. I, for the longest time, thought your name was Sam, and you were bad Sam. <laughs> so uh, you are not alone. <laughs> P- I can, so actually, I, you kind of use that as a filter in my email. If somebody writes me an email that says, hey, Sam, hey, Sam. I, I know that they have no idea who I am. <laughs> So, yeah, for the longest time, I'm like, who's bad Sam and why is he bad? Yeah. Bad now, D Sam. is actually my middle initial. So, mm, very, very cool. Uh, guys, go to our website, jfknetwork.com. If you're watching this live, subscribe to the podcast wherever our podcasts are available. Is Paul back next week or no? He's not back. No, I don't think he is. Yeah. So, I think Mary Jo Foley will be on next week. I have not confirmed 100%, but I think it'll be Mary Jo. Uh, I'm. I'm I think it is. I, I got to check the calendar. I have it somewhere. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Guys, if you also um, want to help us out at the show, you could fund our Patreon. It helps pay for me and Paul. Whenever Paul comes, we drink together, and it's because of you guys. Go to patreon.com slash what the tech. You could go fund us there just the, as little as $1 per episode. You could fund us and get access to the bonus content that we do. Uh, starting in September, we're going to go back to a regular schedule. Not in the sporadic time changes and things like that. It's been very, very um, hectic <laughs> with everything that's been going on between Paul's move and Paul's travel and, and my uh, job and, and the kids and the home renovation. So it's been crazy. So we're going back in September. Uh, everything's going to be back to normal. Until next time, guys. See you later. <laughs>